All right, well, let's see if we can find some perfect numbers now. So we proved previously that if p and q are prime and n is the product of p times q, then n will be a perfect number if and only if p and q are related in this fashion. And so that says I can try and find perfect numbers. Well, maybe. Let's see how this works. <coughs> so we want to find two primes p and q with the relationship p equals q plus 1 over q minus 1. And so since p can be computed from q, we could just try out different values of q and see what primes p we can produce. So first prime, p equals 2. And so if q equals 2, then this quotient, q plus 1 over q minus 1, is going to be 3 over 1, is going to be 3. And remember, p also has to be a prime number, so 3 works. And so the product, 2 times 3, also works. So n equals 6, which is a perfect number. Well, that worked out pretty well. So let's try our next prime number. So if we could have q equals 3. And so if q is equal to 3, then q plus 1, that's 4. q minus 1, 2. 4 over 2 gives us p equals 2. And n is the product, 3 times 2. Again, n equals 6 is a perfect number, but it's not a different one. Well, our next prime, q equals 5. And q plus 1 over q minus 1. 5 plus 1 over 5 minus 1, that's 6 over 4, except that isn't an integer, so it has no hope of being a prime number. And actually, we have this problem. We could keep trying different values of q to find additional primes p, but after a while, we'd find that nothing really works. So again, let's be suspicious that maybe there aren't any other perfect numbers that are the product of two primes. Well, let's see where we go with that. So let's try some deduction here. I need q plus 1 over q minus 1 to be p. So let's uh, try a little bit of algebra here. That means I need q plus 1 to be the product of two numbers, p and q minus 1. Um, if in doubt, we can multiply things out. So here's something that may be useful to do. q plus 1 is q minus 1 plus 2. And the reason that I want to do this is that gives me a q minus 1. And I already have a q minus 1, which gives us some hope of doing a factorization. So let's rearrange our terms. And we find that 2 is p minus 1 times q minus 1. Now, I'm not going to do the full algebraic derivation here. I suggest you convince yourself that if I do that, I do actually get 2 as the product p minus 1 times q minus 1. And that tells me that 2 is the product of two numbers. Well, 2 is also prime, which means that one of these numbers is 1, and the other one's going to be 2. So either p minus 1 is 1, and q minus 1 is 2, which gives us the solution p equals 2, q equals 3, or vice versa. p minus 1 is 2, q minus 1 is 1, and again, p is 3, q is 2, and in both cases we get n equals 6 as our perfect number. Now, remember that we started with the idea that n is the product of two primes. All of this work tells us that if n is the product of two primes, it has to be 6. And so I can join my first statement, n is the product of two primes, to my last statement, n has to be 6, and I end up with the following conclusion. First off, if n equals q plus 1 over q minus 1, the primes have to be 2 and 3. And if I put everything together, that tells me that n is 6. And in the case where n is the product of two primes and n is perfect, the only possibility there is n has to be equal to 6. And I could reword this somewhat more positively. n equals 6 is the only product of two primes that is also a perfect number. Huh. Well, what that means is that if we have a perfect number, it will not be the product of two primes. It'll be the product of more than two primes. Well, it may help to consider some additional empirical evidence. Uh, so we found 6 as a perfect number. Our next perfect number was 28. Here we have 28 as the product of three prime numbers, 2, again 2, and 7. So 28, 2 times 2 times 7. 
And let's assume we didn't have the patience to find 496 or 8,128 as the next perfect numbers. Just these two examples suggest that maybe my perfect numbers might be found among things that look like 2 to some power times a prime number. So let's see where that takes us. As before, we'll start with any assumption we want to and see what conclusions we can draw from it in the hopes that we'll actually be able to find something interesting and useful. Potentially useful, much more important that it be interesting. So here, I'm going to assume that p is a prime number and n 2 to power k times p is perfect. Well, first off, we can go through our proper divisors of n. They're going to be 1, 2, 2 squared, and so on, up to the power 2 to the k, then p, 2p, 2 squared p, and so on, up to 2 to the power k minus 1 times p. And the sum of the proper divisors, well, add all of those things together. And the first thing that's worth noting is this first portion of the sum is a geometric series. And I know how to add together all the terms of a geometric series. It looks like that. The second part is p times another geometric series. And again, I know how to add together the terms of a geometric series. It looks something like that. And after all the dust settles, I end up with a nice similar expression for what the sum is. Now, since n is a perfect number, this sum should be equal to the number itself. And I can do a little bit of algebra. So I'll rearrange this and I get p equals 2 to the power k minus 1. And joining the starting statement, p is prime and n equals 2 to the k, p is perfect, to the ending statement, I now have an important conclusion that I can draw. If I have a perfect number of the form 2 to the k times p, p itself is a prime number of the form 2 to the k plus 1 minus 1, which is a nice conclusion, except in terms of creating perfect numbers, it's set up the wrong way. Because again, what I have is I'm starting with the perfect number, and now I know something about it. What I actually want is to start with something else and then say, aha, here we have a perfect number. Fortunately, our proof is 100% reversible because, again, it's based on algebra. Although, again, we need to actually go through these steps to verify that we can reverse all of them. And what that gives us is the following information. If p is prime, n equals 2 to the power k, p is perfect if and only if p is of the form 2 to the k plus 1 minus 1. And Somewhat more elegantly, we can let n be k plus 1. And so that gives us p equals 2 to the n minus 1. And then what's neat here, this value k here is going to be n minus 1. And so we have our final replacement here. n equals 2 to the power n minus 1. 2 to the n minus 1 is perfect if and only if. 2 to the n minus 1 is a prime number. And these form what are called the Euclidean perfect numbers. And so I can find them pretty straightforward. I try at different values of n, and I find if n equals 2, 2 to the 2 minus 1, 3 is prime, so 6 is perfect. If n equals 3, 2 to the 3rd minus 1, 7, prime number, so 28 is perfect. n equals 4, not prime, go on to the next. Prime gives me 496. 63, not prime, go on to the next. 127, prime, 8128 is a perfect number. Not prime, go on to the next. 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 Not prime. Finally, we get the next prime, 8191. So 2 to the 13 minus 1 times 8191. 33, 5, 53, 36 is our next perfect number. And so we have our Euclidean perfect numbers. A good proof raises new questions. And in this particular case, it's a lot of work determining whether or not we get a prime number. And it might be useful if we knew when we produced prime numbers. And so the next question that we might want to ask, when is 2 to the power n minus 1 going to be a prime number? And we'll take a look at that next.